Good evening. That's it. Good. Good. We'll be available to those uh, unable to make it. This is uh, NASJA. This is NASJA's professional development seminar on Zoom. The date's February 23rd, and we're going to talk about pitching, pitching the media. This is the latest in a professional development series. Our last one talked about smartphone tips, photography tips, using your smartphones. And a link to that is in the last newsletter. The newsletter now has a name. It's called Snow Scoops. We're quite mm -hmm. proud of ourselves for making a contest <laughs> and giving our uh, Larry Turner came up with that name uh, uh, a gift in, re in return for that. Uh, just some calendar items for you to note. March 23rd is going to be our annual meeting. Um, again, on Zoom, we're going to talk about the state of the association. I'm happy to say we're holding at 129 press and 55 corporate. Um, we are also going to announce the winners of our Hirsch Awards in books, words, and images. We'll announce that on March 23rd. And also the winners of the Carson White, the Bob Gillen, and the Mitch Kaplan Awards. These are our highest awards in the NASGE Association, which has been around for uh, just about 60, about 60 years. Um, April, in April, we're gonna have another professional development session on how to get a book published, how to get, how to get yourselves published. And that'll be the topic of our professional development in April. We'll set up a date for that. And in May, we're, of course, we're gonna have an awards ceremony. May I have the envelope, uh, please? Uh, but we have a question for all, all of you now. Um, and please put your answers into chat for, uh, for MP and I to, uh, to look at. Are these seminars that we do, like tonight's, are they better seven o'clock Eastern time, like tonight, <laughs> or are they better one o'clock Eastern time during the business days? So please uh, uh, jump on chat and tell us which you prefer. Hey, I'm good. <laughs> time. It's, uh, I'm good. Let's see. Peggy says I vote, oh, it, I lost it. I see a lot of sevens. Anything is fine for me, Todd. Okay. I see That's a one fine. from Heather. All right. Okay. And, and you want it earlier. MP if you'll MP and Megan, if you'll yeah. uh, tabulate we'll that. Track. Yeah. And keep track of that. Bob, during this talk, if um, you'll have any questions, and I hope you do, please post those questions in the chat. And MP yeah. and Megan will uh, will moderate that and ask the questions. And then if we do have time, you can ask those live. Until then, please uh, mute or mut. <laughs> not yourself. <laughs> I've asked our panelists to speak for about five to six minutes each, which will get us out of here in about 60 minutes. My favorite movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And what do they say in that movie? Always be closing. And if you close mm -hmm. enough sales, you get steak knives. Here in, <laughs> in, in the media business, we need to always be pitching. Perhaps 80% of the time, we need to be pitching and find out where the next story is, is uh, uh, where the next assignment is, is going to be. You've got to have 10, 20 balls up in the air and always have pitches going out. Uh, my friend uh, Sarah uh, Bakuda in, in Longmont, I know you do that uh, quite, quite actively. And I see your stories all the time, not just in ski, but just across the board. Um, so always be pitching. And knowing the magazine is, is <laughs> critical. And and I particularly know um, our, the magazine for our next, our first speaker is Skiing History Magazine. Skiing History is so self-explanatory. What do they deal with? They deal with skiing history. And I have been so successful because, you know, I'm a nerd, a gear nerd and an equipment nerd. I have pitched and written stories about Boda bags. Remember that, which, which is a great product now for being socially distant. You just <laughs> squirt Jagermeyer, Jagermeyer into their mouths. Astral tunes. Some of you younger members may not realize we used to strap car uh, eight track decks to our chest to ski with astral tunes. I've written about uh, skiing in Looney Tunes on, uh, on TV, crazy ski products and, and skiing on uh, TV sitcoms like uh, Dick Van Dyke Show. And they've all landed in Skiing History Magazine. So it's a perfect example of understanding the media. Greg Detrinko, you're up. After ski bumming in Sun Valley after college, Greg headed to Colorado and was the editor of the Aspen Daily News for several years. 
while also attempting to edit a newsletter for Hunter S. Thompson. He next joined the New York Times Magazine Group as senior editor at Snow Country before moving to Ski Magazine. He helped with just about all the edit and sales aspects at Ski, working at Ski for 20 years. I'm sure, Sarah, you, you, you'll get a lot of tips from Greg on how to survive there. Um, and most recently, um, he was the editorial director of Ski. Greg recently joined Skiing History as its editor and still regularly gets back to Sun Valley. Greg, hey. your advice on pitching. Hey guys, I'll make this fast. And uh, Jeff, do give me the hook if I'm running long, certainly. Uh, let's see, I, yeah, I recently joined Skiing International, uh, Skiing History Association, affectionately known as ISHA. We come out six times a year. We cost $49 a year, which you all can afford. We're a nonprofit uh, with the challenges of a nonprofit association. We put out our magazine six times a year with a part-time staff of two people. So that's mm. fun. And I do mean it, it is fun. <laughs> What's particularly cool about this particular brand is skiing is still young enough where we can actually interview and talk to the pioneers of the sport. We can talk to the dudes and the gals who literally invented the stuff. So that's really cool about this particular brand. Not surprisingly, our readers tend to be a little bit older, though I recently joined and one of my personal missions is to try to expand our reader base to a younger uh, demographic. Uh, and that's something I'm taking very seriously. Uh, Jeff, uh, who mentioned a bunch of his great stories, he's a great pitcher. Of course, all your stories, Jeff, were brilliantly edited, I might add, for this publication. Um, <laughs> You, you came up with a bunch of stuff on uh, that we can go over. Uh, let me see, what do you look for in a pitch? Short, 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 short. Uh, you can do worse than assume every editor you're talking to guys is now doing the job of four or five people 10 years ago. So short is good. We're all suffering from time poverty. That helps a lot. It's good to know the magazine, as Jeff uh, noted. Also, a good pitch is very similar to a good story. Uh, there's a strong voice, there's strong color, and most importantly, you are exhibiting nuance in whatever topic you're addressing. You need to tell the editor something he or she doesn't know, or more importantly, something he or she that the reader doesn't know. How important is it to see previous samples? No, we can go over that fast. Uh, what great pitches do you uh, remember? A great pitch is like a Venn diagram, guys, with three circles. The perfect pitch really is the intersection of popular culture, the intersection of your topic that you're addressing, and immediacy. So when you're right in that center with the three circles overlap. For instance, Jeff's Boda Bag pitch, which he mentioned, <laughs> popular in the 70s. No, it's a great pitch. It's popular in the 70s, but it had a nice current hook because you don't have to pass around and share a bottle of wine or share a bottle of beer and have a <laughs> bunch of lips touch it. The Boda bag is socially acceptable. You know, is that real? Does it happen a lot? Not necessarily, but it's a really cool hook and it was just really timely. So again, it was in that Venn diagram. Let's see another really nice pitch. And this was a short item. It was 300 words, but it was a great pitch. The Royals, which is a very popular TV show, had a avalanche scene, which was a real avalanche involving uh, Prince Charles, and the we camp. did a fact check on it, or a writer did a fact <laughs> check on it. So again, the Venn diagram, the intersection of popular culture, your area of expertise, which in this case was avalanches, and immediacy. So that works really well. A third pitch, recent pitch that comes to mind, guys, was the history of the X Games. Now, most people don't think the X Games have a history, but they do. History doesn't mean it has to happen in 1892. X Games started in 1997 and included shovel racing. So that's kind of fun right there. The third X Games were actually hosted by Mount Snow, which people didn't know. They think of Aspen. So those are three pitches that really were on a wide range addressed historical um, uh, immediacy, which, which we like. Tips for getting through to me or most editors, I think it's email. Should you call an editor? When's the last time you picked up a phone call from a, from a, a number that wasn't your contact list, right? This doesn't happen. Uh, I don't know, Jeff, that's probably close to four minutes, but I can go on forever if you want. Um, no, that's good. What's yeah. the most common error? Let me just go to this 
quickly. Most common error, pitches are too long and meandering. I don't need to go into that too deep. The, uh, a related error I honestly find, which is a little frustrating, but I, by the way, all these errors I have done for years. So I'm not being presumptive that I know better, but the, just what I see. Uh, stories that are submitted way too long. I mean, you know, three or 400 words too long is fine. But if you're assigned, assigned a 2,000 or 3,000 word or a 1,000 word feature and it comes in at 3,000 words, that's just bad. And editors, editors don't like to send back stories because it just adds another layer and it really expands the process. So try to hit a reasonable length, plus or minus, uh, in, your, in your deliveries. And this last one's a little touchy, but I did get that at Ski Magazine. I hope Sierra doesn't get it. But, and, and I've done this myself. Good writers sometimes write down to either the fee or the brand they're writing for. If it's not the New York Times, they don't give it the New York Times treatment. If it's something that they consider a second brand or a short or a small circulation or it's a lousy fee, and these are good writers, they can write down to the level of either the pay or the brand. And that's just kind of unprofessional. And I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. So it's just something that kind of grinds my gears a little bit. And I think other editors may have uh, kind of suffered through that. So that's all, it's good to see everybody. Thank you, Greg. Good to answer any questions after this August group is done. Yep, we'll have questions at the end. Our next speaker I've uh, had the privilege of skiing with, Heather Freed. She's editor-in-chief for the NSAA Journal, a ski industry trade magazine. It publishes five times annually. She brings many years of experience to the ski industry in the digital space from her time at onthesnow.com in Vail Resorts. And she currently is working with her team up to build a digital presence, presence of the journal and the overall NSAA brand. She's a skier, I can attest to that, and a hiker and a yogi. Heather. You didn't, you didn't want to say the part about a, a future NASJA award winner? <laughs> since I, in the time since I sent you my bio, I also discovered I'm an out of touch millennial who's clinging to my emojis of yore. But uh, thanks for the intro. So uh, intro to the journal, uh, we are a trade publication that goes out to a membership of about 330 ski areas across the US and Canada. Um, we hit the desk of mostly resort leadership. So owner, operator, GM, director of ops, um, and some of our more recent content is gonna, is, has been designed to broaden the appeal of the journal to more operations and frontline staff like uh, lift maintenance personnel. Um, our content tends to revolve around a few pillars. So uh, we, we are uh, heavy on risk and safety, sustainability, all aspects of operations and uh, growing the sport and as part of growing the sport of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And our features tend to be long form, multi-source stories. Um, and we also publish quite a few profiles of really interesting ski industry leaders um, and uh, ski areas that exemplify trends and so forth. So um, regarding what stories resonate with our readers, uh, we try as much as we can to theme our oh, issues. Okay. New, and the new, one um, issue I have to say got the most feedback from just every direction was the small ski areas issue, um, which was our theme for the fall 2020, for fall 2020. And uh, we shared a lot of really cool stories from smaller ski areas, like the world's only recirculating mountaintop whitewater course that uh, I had to write that one down. Wisp Resort in Maryland runs from their snowmaking water source in the summer. And uh, another one was the national toboggan championships out of Camden Snow Bowl in Maine. Mm -hmm. So this was a really engaging uh, topic for our team internally as well. And we're definitely going to continue to give shine to the small community ski areas. And as far as what constitutes small, um, our NSAA technical definition is vertical transport feet per hour. But um, for other purposes of, of these profiles, it's kind of more of just like a home hill vibe. So any pitches around that are welcome. As far as what I look for in a great pitch, um, I love it when people just come right out and connect the dots for me so I can see clearly how the story will be providing new information to our readers and otherwise um, of value to our ski area audience. 
I love it when writers suggest ideas for accompanying graphics, photos, infographics, breakouts, sidebars, maps, um, just because we've been really trying to make the journal increasingly visually appealing and not just a, a wall of words. Um, if it's a trending topic like COVID, include how you will go deeper and find an interesting angle that hasn't been covered yet. And more importantly, will this angle still be relevant in two, three, four months when it actually hits the desk? Um, and, and just on that note, a great pitch takes lead times into account, of course, on, in the print world. Um, and we're typically working about two to three months out at least. The pitch should be either really specific with the sources you're planning to interview and why, or I'm actually open to a no pitch pitch, which is where you kind of just sell yourself. Um, and the reason for that is that I would say probably, I don't know, 90% of our content comes from within NSAA. And it's not because we're especially esoteric or we're only interested in our own viewpoints, but um, the team is such a passionate group of really seasoned ski industry professionals. And I just am loaded up with content. They, they're always talking to people in the industry constantly. So I'm, I'm always loaded up with content. I have a huge database of ideas and I rarely get to it because there's so many story ideas that just come at me all the time, which is a good problem to have. Um, so I think if you come to me as a writer and say, hey, I've written for NSAA, or here's my background, my interest, my writing style, then I can match you up with the right story when it comes along and you didn't have to spend time pitching. So win-win. Um, and I like to see writing samples. Um, I, it's just nice to see your, your style and your tone and your voice and if it's a good fit for the journal. And I also like to see how writers can, how they do balancing multiple sources. Um, I like Greg prefer email. I don't answer my phone when I don't know who's calling. Um, and that, it just gives me time to read through everything and give it a think, um, <laughs> file it away into the appropriate buckets. Um, so when the opportunity comes up, I, I have it right there, ready to go. Error, um, I guess, I don't know if there are any PR people in the audience, but I would say a lot of times if you get pitches from PR folks representing clients, it's a little bit muddled as to who they're representing, who's gonna be doing the writing. So just making everything really clear. And um, while we do profile individual ski areas, as I mentioned, we don't often cover single products or companies or standalone events. So the PR person needs to kind of go the extra mile to contextualize uh, their client's offering or their client's story in the scope of a greater trend. Um, and then I love the question about print and online and how it will evolve. And I don't know the answer to that, but I'm here to say that B2B, in the B2B realm, print is still really strong and remains the preference of most of our ski area members. And in fact, they don't, we found they don't even like to share their print copies with each other uh, so that they can take their time with the content, which to me is just music to my ears, of course. And that's it. I well, see great. the rest of my time, if there is any. Thanks so much. <laughs> you know, um, as a writer and a freelancer myself, um, I always try to source photography from the people I'm talking to in the interviews I'm doing, I, I find that it saves time for the editor if they don't have to go scramble at the last minute for images. And of course the images have to be high resolution, otherwise they don't, they don't really count, which is hard to do with Skiing History Magazine when the images are like from the 1940s. <laughs> well, our next speaker really puts the North American in the North American Snow Sports Journalists Association. He's from Canada, uh, Todd Lawson. He's publisher, producer, photo editor at Mountain Life Media. It's one of Canada's most respective outdoor media companies. Todd brings to the table a solid track record of brand team and community building while staying true to the company mission of connecting people to the magic of the mountains. Together with the Mountain Life team, he's dedicated to spreading the message with integrity and passion through traditional 
award-winning print publications in a rapidly evolving digital and media social media social media space you can tell he wrote that himself thank you todd for spinning that <laughs> and take it away todd are you sure you didn't write that jeff <laughs> <clears throat> thank you thanks uh i just wanted to say thanks for thanks to everyone thank you guys for putting this together um i think um we as a collective here are the people that are driving the culture behind skiing in winter and it's nice to see so many dedicated faces here keeping it alive. So I think that's uh, ultra important to, for all of us and just to our readers out there. And just to, I think, you know, you said it in there, in my bio there, our, our whole mission is to keep people from all walks of life connected to the magic of the mountains. And, and uh, we do that in several ways. So um, just for me, a good pitch has to have, uh, relevance to our audience like you got to know we publish um, 11 different titles throughout Canada and mostly regional so know your region you know know what's going on in that region and you know we're lucky that we're we're not just a ski magazine uh, we're uh, we're all about mountain culture and everything that encompasses that so um, we're looking for everything you know everything to do with the mountains, skiing, mountain biking, anything. So um, yeah, I think a good pitch also, we are very, very photo driven magazine. So if you can send images along with your pitches, that is crucial. Cause if we can see, um, you know, obviously we we're, um, we're so visual as a society, if we can be driven by that first and and the words um, obviously go hand in hand. So I just wanted to share an example of how a pitch, a good pitch kind of gets spread throughout. So this was a pitch, uh, it's called The Long Lost Ski Goddess. And it's about um, not Ular, but Skadi, and her name is Skadi. So that's the Norwegian <laughs> goddess of snow. So it was pitched to us. We ran it as a one pager uh, in our fall winter issue. And then it did so good that we managed to, we turned it into a cover for one of our other issues. Um, and we paid the writer twice because we published it in this issue as well. And then we decided to turn it into a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a really good uh, win, 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 win for us because everybody won from that idea we got we had an artist artist do the custom art for us the brewery got on board um now and now it's even a t-shirt and a and a coffee mug if you want to get one of those so so that was an example of a really good unique angle you know no everybody hears about ular but nobody heard about scatty she was kind of um you know forgotten in the annals of history there and but now we brought her to life and um, that was a good success story of a pitch gone right and you know this wasn't one that had any images at all so we used we used artwork there and just doubled down on that and it and it did really good so um yeah that's i think that's just all about uniqueness you know i think a lot of people are going to say that um it's as unique as, as unique gets that's what we're interested in um we don't care about seeing previous writing samples uh, same goes for photos. I don't care. We don't really care who the story is about. It doesn't have to have a professional athlete at all. Um, you know, it's just about, it's about the angle and um, how relevant it is to our audience again. Um, how long is the ideal query? I will um, echo what I believe it was some JD maybe. Um, it doesn't have to be long. It just has to get to the point. We don't need to read the whole story in your query. We just need to know, you know, the five dubs, I guess, and um, and where you think it would be a good fit for our magazine. Um, how long in advance should contributors plan to confirm their articles with you? Yeah, we don't hammer out our editorial lineup um, a year in advance, for example. We usually do it uh, two or three months in advance, especially now because things are moving, you know, at such a crazy speed and changing up every day. So uh, we will usually send 
to our writers a call out, writers and photographers, on what the issue theme is and what we're looking for within. And then they'll shoot, shoot us back a bunch of queries and stuff like that. But that's a great way for us to stay connected with, you know, um, our writers and photographers be, because without them, we wouldn't have a magazine. So we endeavor to pay them well and to pay them on time. And um, that keeps the wheel turning uh, really, really solidly there. Uh, what else can I answer here? Yeah, so I think just in a nutshell, um, you know, it's important to know what is happening out there and have the unique spin on it always. It's like, you know, for example, we don't feature any stories like about races or racing. We don't publish any photos of the bib number on it. Normally that's kind of a rule of thumb with us because for us, it's about the soulful connection. So if we have a soulful connection to our readers, uh, you know, and you know, it, there, it's, it's not a blanket rule. It's just a, it's just an offering to our writers to say, you know, look for the unique at all times and, and give us to that in the most succinct pitch you can give us and have good photos. Always have good photos. Thanks so much, Todd. Yeah, thank you, guys. Our next speaker, uh, let me just stop this and reset. Okay, our next speaker is Ian McMillan. He has a career spanning 26 years. Uh, he says he's the longest sitting magazine editor in Canada. In ca Canada. <laughs> Canada. Canada. I got that. Possibly the longest oh, sitting. Canada. Possibly. Thank you. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> possibly the longest sitting ski magazine editor possibly in the world it's in its 50th year ski canada is in its 50th year of publication and it's beaten the odds with paid circulation magazines holding strong by not specializing in one genre and keeping tight purse strings and most importantly he continues to hear from readers regularly with praise complaints and suggestions he is married to contributing gear editor ray o'reilly and his three grown daughters. And when the snows melted, well, he spends his time messing around in boats, sail and kite when it's windy, paddle and skull when it's flat. Ian, take it away. Did I, did I give you all that material? I don't oh yeah, know you wrote every word, <laughs> yes. You know, I have 50 years, uh, 50 years of Ski Canada. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, this is 26 years for me as editor. And I did a couple of years, uh, back in the eighties when we were on typewriters and stat cams and uh, wax machines for repo. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Wax machines, probably not. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Um, but uh, yeah, we learned long ago that uh, the for every cliff hucking semi-pro backcountry skier, there's 10,000 uh, much less sexy ordinary skiers who, who spend money on gear and trips and magazines too. So um, uh, even though uh, all the writers want to be writing about uh, backcountry adventures and uh, what we like the most we have to keep in mind that uh, some of the least sexy stuff like like ski tips um, will be regularly our, be our number one downloaded um, material online not that anybody here is uh, is going to be pitching me on on instructional tips because we already have an instruction editor but uh, a, as a unique an idea can be um, it, be, it doesn't have to be crazy unique. It can be something that's simple, nostalgic, uh, that, that rings true with um, with all of our readers. But our readers are 80% uh, male. They're uh, more than 80% will say that they're uh, expert. Uh, they say they're expert or advanced <laughs> skiers, but yet they still like uh, tips. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there's a lot that was said by, by Greg and Todd and, and Heather that I don't need to re repeat things like uh, keeping pitches uh, uh, short and uh, I'll ask later if I need uh, need to see writing samples. It's hugely important to when somebody gives me a if it's a unique uh, pitch. Uh, my first question is how, how are the photos because we if if the especially if the pitch comes in when it's out of season, I, we can't go and send a send a photographer. And if it's in a really strange place or a strange person or whatever the story is about, uh, if there's no no imagery, there's there's no staff here to to run out. And that's something that a lot of writers kind of forget about. Um, so if you're working with a photographer, even, even better. Um, and photos, we can work with uh, phone photos, but you have to have a very high level of phone. Like a, we have run full page shots from uh, iPhones, but they're iPhone 12s or iPhone 11s, not from yeah. iPhone 6s. 
Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how big the file is, it's how, how good the photo is. Um, trying to think of other things that uh, hasn't, hasn't been discussed. Uh, I'm one editor who does answer the phone, actually. Um, nobody <laughs> phones anymore. So uh, if it's just, a, if it's your first pitch, uh, the, the first contact, probably uh, email is better. Don't send your emails at night and don't send them at uh, on weekends because I don't, uh, even though I work and I'm freelance worker and other things at night or on weekends, I don't want to be uh, thinking, oh, I have to get back to that so it's Saturday afternoon. I have to get back to that uh, Monday morning. And by Monday morning, there's hundreds and hundreds of other emails after you. <laughs> so uh, think about um, when it's going to be read. Uh, and uh, yeah, as far as phoning, um, I, I even answer the ones that come in from China. And um, because the phone rings maybe two or three times a day now, it's not like the old days where it just ran off the hook. Uh, at least ring up. Um, as far as following up, I, that's true too. The the sometimes it's a great idea, and I put a little star beside it on email, and then several hundred get on top of it, and they forget all about it. <laughs> and then somebody uh, will contact me again another ten days, two weeks, or whatever. Uh, that's you're not, you're not pestering me at all. Like a, I'll tell you if you're if you're pestering me, um, it's a it's probably a good idea to follow up. It's a lot of this is kind of theoretical too with Ski Canada because we have um I because we're a paid subscription magazine and because we get a postal subsidy from the government of Canada uh, we I have to limit the number of foreign contributors that uh, I can uh, give commissions to so for photography and and um and writing so uh, I we can sometimes get some a lot of great ideas from Europe and the, and the U.S. but I can't run with them because we just we're a little <laughs> quota for how many uh, foreign contributors um the uh I'm trying to think of other things that uh, haven't been talked about um the uh i still get a lot of stuff or, or even it's, it's written a story will come in that needs a lot of work because it just they forget who the who it's for we're, we're a paid subscription magazine you're writing for the reader you're not writing because you're hosted by the resort or because you got free gear and you you want to pitch, you want to um, puff up the, um, the free shit stuff, which uh, mm. uh, readers don't, I mean, readers want to read, hear, hear about it, but they would rather get a unique uh, angle on uh, on the resort or the gear or whatever it is that's being written about rather than just uh, playing PR, PR host. Mm -hmm. And if it's something controversial, mm. if it rained while you were there, we're happy to, <laughs> if, if you can spin it in a, in a fun and entertaining way, or if it's, uh, um, I get in trouble from readers all the time for uh, corrupting their children, which I find really strange <laughs> the day of the internet. Uh, or if it's a, um, they find something that's wrong or that's been missed. Uh, and those letters to the editor always go to, to the beginning of the, uh, the, the letters page because the uh, ones who are loving us and everything, they make boring reading. So it's, uh, don't feel like it's a, um, if something con is controversial, it's, it, it's not gonna be run or if it's, um, if you need to use the F word and copy, then let's go ahead. It's, it's well placed and we don't, we don't rip it out. In fact, I often change when someone else will say heck or something and we change it to hell just because it sounds, it just doesn't sound real. Um, if it's a, uh, if you're writing for a Canadian magazine like C Canada, we use Canadian spelling and it's so easy to, to, to write uh, right from the beginning, switch to British or Canadian spelling on Microsoft or whatever yet stuff constantly comes in where you have to go through nitpicking, looking for all these little things that um, sometimes we don't catch one by one because it's not a, uh, it's not like a magic wand with Microsoft Word to switch it all to um, uh, British spelling, but uh, things that just make it easier for the, for the uh, editor when there's limited time to spend on, on a copy. Um, and that, that goes back to the, what everybody was saying, uh, photos, if there, is, if there are images or even if you have, a photographer who would uh, uh, would be the best photographer or photographers to to contact uh, that that will sell or, or kill the story idea right away. Um, and um, thank you, Ian. I can't think of yes. I can't think of anything else to add there. <laughs> yeah, and Ian, you bring up my my number one pet peeve. It's emails on the weekends. You know, guys, we are pounded by emails from Monday through Friday. When the weekend comes, where does it say we have to answer emails? on a Saturday and Sunday. So actually what, what, what I do is, what? yeah, I answer emails, but I don't send them until Monday morning. I put them in the save file and then pump them out on Monday morning. Cause I think, I just think it's rude. 
to send an email or a pitch or, or whatever on a on a weekend. Wait, wait. And somebody's got to mute themselves. Um, yeah. No rest for the wicked, Jeff. <laughs> no rest. <laughs> uh, Mike, Mike, you're up. Mike Rogi, Rogi, sorry. Yeah, you nailed it. Is nailed it. Is an award winning and uh, he admits a, uh, an award losing journalist. In uh, 2020, he revitalized the legendary Mountain Gazette, once home to the work of Edward Abbey, Dolores La Chapelle, and Hunter S. Thompson, among others. Uh, their spring issue, Mountain Gazette, number 195, that arrives in May. He lives in North Lake Tahoe with his wife, his two-year-old son, and two dogs. Take it away, Mike. Okay, thanks. Uh, quickly, Jeff, I mentioned this to you and MP, uh, when I was 17, I started writing for newschoolers.com and uh, Mitch Kaplan actually reached out to me and invited me to my first NASU event at Stratton, which was really cool. And I remember um, the theme was print versus digital. Uh, I'm here today to tell you about a print only magazine that I run, but back then I was um, berated by several of your members, a couple that I recognize on this call, uh, <laughs> for saying that digital was the future. But now I'm here groveling, asking for your forgiveness because I don't know if digital is the future. I, I, I know for sure that print is. Um, yeah, my name is Mike. Um, I run a uh, profitable debt-free print title in 2021 that I launched during the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> and the way I was able to do that was um, I gave a shit about my readers. And that's it. That was it. I cared about them. Um, we published twice per year. We're an 11 by 14, or excuse me, 11 by 17 format. So we're uh, almost a foot tall and nearly two feet wide when you open it. So it's poster size. Um, I'm not sure if some of you knew Mike Moore, who is the founder of Mountain Gazette. But when I was looking into purchasing the magazine, I learned that uh, Mike Moore used to publish 20 and 30,000 word manuscripts in his paper. Ah. And uh, and I want to I want to do that again. I I, I want to make sure that uh, people have a space to tell their best work in our magazine. Uh, what I I wrote a few notes down, but what I want to say is um please please don't pitch to me what you think I care about. I'm pretty active on social media. It's easy to find me. Um, I want you to pitch what you care about. Every single issue of Mountain Gazette is pretty different. Um, I like to say that it's not my magazine, it's yours. Um, and I think that's what our subscribers want. They know that our articles, um, our photos are a reflection of the people that are submitting them versus, uh, you know, trying to have some big editorial mission. I say that our stories happen anytime you walk outdoors. Um, our contributors range in age 14 uh, to age 84. I believe that's how old Dick Dorworth is now. I'm not sure. He might be 104. But uh, our last issue, the theme with COVID going on was um, the idea about the, uh, for the first time in human history, we all collectively went through some shit together. Everybody handled it differently. And so I wanted to write about um, what we gained, what we lost. Um, Dick wrote a really beautiful piece about losing Spider Savage, who was one of his best friends. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that's a story that, that took place a, a long while ago, um, but it's relevant based on the topic. Our next topic is um, is like taking that first step forward with exploration. I feel like we're all kind of wondering like, when will we be taking masks off? When will we be getting vaccinated? When will the world sort of return to some semblance of normalcy? And what I, how I view that is that exploration is gonna be totally brand new. Um, I will say as far as pitching, um, don't be intimidated. Uh, in our last issue, we had folks from The New Yorker, Paris Review, New York Times, Vice, uh, Vice on HBO, and The Atlantic. And I can tell you that all of them were more afraid than any of you because they thought they could not write for an outdoor publication because they don't ski, they don't hike, or whatever, but they have really good outdoor stories, but they were intimidated. Mm -hmm. um, so I would all say that like I would be intimidated writing for any of those publications, but trust your skill and and you know, as far as pitching goes, we do a little something different. Um, you can go, because we change uh, themes every issue, you can go to our submissions page on the Mountain Gazette and uh, sign up for the contributor email list. Don't worry, we're not gonna sell you like spam or anything like that, but we collect anyone that wants to write for us, truly anyone. Um, 
can go. And then what I do is I email folks. Um, so 195 comes out the beginning of May, probably like the middle of May. I'll say, okay, 196, it's our fall issue. Here's what we're thinking the theme's gonna be, send pitches. So we actually reach out to you and call for submissions for every single issue. Um, because we're twice a year, we um, support our writers and our photographers with longer editorial missions. So uh, we have one writer who's been working on a piece since October of last year, and that won't run until this fall. Uh, thank you for whoever just subscribed. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> that very cool of you. Um, uh, we... Um, we have another writer who's been working on a piece that won't be published for two years. Um, cool. The way we do this is um, we charge $60 a year. We charge $30 a magazine. And what we do is we tell our subscribers, we take, it's really simple business model. We take your money, we collect it, and we give it to super talented writers and photographers to make excellent work that you then get to enjoy. It's a circle. It works really well. And they seem like this is a very new concept for them, the idea of paying for high quality media, um, but it's working. And so what I would say is when you want to pitch Mountain Gazette, um, like I said, I'm really easy to find. You guys all have my email address uh, or you can get it through Jeff or MP, um, especially this group. Like I said, I owe a lot to uh, the people in this room and Nazio because Mitch Kaplan showed me that I could be a ski journalist for my entire life and not just like a hobby in high school and college. And so um, I hope that answers some of your questions. Mm -hmm. um, as far as our subscriber base, uh, we have a lot of folks in metropolitan, we're obviously in mountain towns. We have a lot of people in metropolitan areas. I'm super proud that we are 51% male and 49% female. Um, we uh, have subscribers all over the world. Uh, we sh just, our first issue just arrived in Tokyo two weeks ago, which is awesome. Uh, we have subscribers in Russia and all over Europe, a couple of folks in Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Cindy. She just said, I'm an MG subscriber. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, the other thing we're working on is, you know, we, we do want to be a community oriented spot. Todd, that's so cool with the beer. Um, we're actually releasing our second collab beer. Um, with uh with alibi and then our hope is that we can wow thank you whoever else just subscribed it's very cool um we really hope that uh we can start doing more community-based events we're working on one in the bay area at um terrapin crossroads um so we're going to do like a little grateful dead night and um if you subscribe to the magazine you get it for free um and if you don't you have to pay five bucks and we'll donate that to a local charity um, but yeah, we're just trying to be a community oriented place. I feel like that's, that's the place for print publications these days is to like rely on local communities and help local communities. We were $500 under budget, um, the last time around. Um, so we donate $500 to the Shane McConkie foundation. Thank um, you, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Well, Mike, I'm, I'm actually quite impressed that a, a, an angel rings a bell every time you get a subscriber. <laughs> Like a little angel rings a little bell for you. I, I like it too. It's very annoying to my wife. Though. Our next speaker is from Ski Magazine. And Ski Magazine, I have I, I hold it near and dear to my heart because my first ski story, professional ski story, appeared in 1980 about how to pick a ski pad. I was so excited to receive $100 for the story that I spent all the money to frame it. So, and it's sitting right in front of me on the wall. Sierra, Sierra Schaefer is a newly appointed editor-in-chief of Ski, which came under new ownership with Pocket Outdoor Media last fall. She's spearheading a repositioning and rebranding of uh, Ski's digital content in the print magazine under a new membership model. Formerly, she worked at Powder Magazine as editor-in-chief. She was the first woman to hold that title. She was on Powder staff for six years. And prior to that, she worked for LA Weekly, and she currently lives in Salt Lake City. And before we start with Sierra, she has some big news to tell us about, about Pocket Outdoor Media. Yeah, so um, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction and for having me. I'm sure um, at this point, you know, that news cycle is about <laughs> 36 hours old, so I'm sure you guys um, have come across 
um, some of the news yesterday, but as Jeff said, um, this is actually a really great and unique time to be having this conversation. So good planning, Jeff. Um, but yesterday, um, our company, our parent company purchased Outside Magazine, um, along with Outside TV and Gaia GPS, um, Peloton Magazine and Athlete Reg. Mm. Um, so as part of that um, and part of the rebranding that Pocket has been um, prepared to go through after you know acquiring the AIM titles, which includes Ski and Backpacker and Climbing, Yoga Journal, all these, um, Rock and Ice and, Cli and Gym Climber, um, they've just been scooping up all these titles um, and are now rebranding under the title of Outside. Um, so Ski Magazine is still Ski Magazine. Um, there's still all of these other pieces, um, but instead of being called Pocket, we'll be called Outside because that's where all these things take place. Um, <laughs> so I know that um, for the, you know, the outside, the consumer that isn't behind the scenes here, that probably means <laughs> nothing to them. Um, but for um, for ski, this means a lot of good things. One, um, it just like Jeff said, you know, we're really committed to kind of repositioning ski um, with a new editorial voice and style, um, kind of diversifying our editorial mix. Um, we've got an increased digital frequency that's gone way up just in the, you know, eight weeks since I've been there. Um, but we're still putting out four print issues a year. Um, so they're really positioning Ski to be able to tell all kinds of different stories. Um, and that obviously matters to you writers because um, there's so much opportunity for growth and new markets and new readers. Um, and I really wanna bring in new voices. Um, and that could include some of you, but we also have initiatives to you know, bring in new BIPOC contributors um, and focus on you know, DEI initiatives that are company-wide. Um, and also eco-friendly initiatives that are company-wide. Um, mm -hmm. But part of the exciting news of um, being under pocket and this active, or sorry, I guess I should say being under outside and this active pass membership um, is that anyone who signs up for an active pass membership. So let's say I go online and I wanna get Ski Magazine, but I also kind of like biking and I'm a little bit curious about signing up for a triathlon and uh, I do a little bit of yoga. So as a member who's interested in all of those things, because as skiers, we have to do something in the off season, right? So I would select those options um, and then I will get fed um, that digital content um, ad-free every time I log in to my account as well. So for writers, it's a really cool opportunity to get your work in front of people who, um, you know, might be kind of on the periphery, but you kind of have the opportunity to bring them in with, with your writing um, because they've selected that they have an interest in ski. Um, mm. So it just broadens our scope to close to like 30 million monthly views um, of participants, which I think is a, just a great opportunity for the writers as well. Um, so as far as, you know, what stories resonate with the readers of ski, um, like I said, we're in the process of repositioning. So we're at a really cool kind of intersection where for so many years, skis focused on, I'd say probably a more older affluent skier who experiences um, the sport primarily through like vacations and trips. Um, and by no means do I have any intention of creating that audience for a new audience. Um, but I really want to invite in also, you know, people who experience skiing as kind of a lifestyle and a defining characteristic. Um, so we have this cool opportunity to capture just a really wide audience um, by speaking to the sport, but also the culture. And so that um, creates a lot of new opportunities for more eyes and new eyes um, on your work. Um, there's been so many good tips. I'm like taking my own notes from all the other <laughs> editors because um, even though, you know, part of my job is to look at and accept pitches all the time. Like it's so hard. Um, and no matter how you, how often you do it, pitching's the worst. Um, so just know that whoever you're pitching to, they've also had to pitch on their own time and it's the worst. Um, so good on you for doing it. <laughs> the more you do, the better. Um, 
But like everyone said, you know, knowing your publication, knowing the audience, I think within skiing, you know, it's not like there's all these new ski areas opening up all the time or new people coming onto the scene, but there's always a new way or new point of view to tell the story. Um, and don't be afraid to pitch something that you feel like has been explored, but if you have a new way to look at it, um, I'm open to that. So, um, you know, tell me about what kind of access you have, like, why are you the person to tell it? Um, and then whatever the hook or tension is, I think everyone's kind of said, you know, finding a unique angle. Um, but the shorter the pitch, the better. Tell me what I need to know, anticipate my questions, um, and don't send the full story in the first email. Um, <laughs> That'll make me a return customer, which I think is kind of um, one of the biggest things I've learned is, you know, I am so much more willing to work with a writer who turns their assignment in on time. The assignment is what we agreed on in the first place. You know, if in the process you find a new angle or a new approach, just talk to me about it or talk to your editor about it and we can adjust. But if I'm expecting a story about, um, Jeff and I get one about Ian, I'm going to be a little <laughs> frustrated and, confused and it's not going to be like an efficient process for anyone. So, um, you know, I'm turning clean copy. Um, and I think just professionalism and responsiveness, like if you're easy to work with you or if you're easy to work with, I'll come back to you for more. And kind of to Heather's point, like, if you're always pitching and even if I'm saying, no, this isn't the right fit, but you're top of mind because you're always in my inbox, um, I'm more likely to turn to those folks um, for assignments that I need writers on. And so be responsive um, and don't be afraid to follow up because I think like Ian said, like Todd said, you know, emails get buried and um, it's not because we don't like you. We're just slammed, but I appreciate the follow up because it shows me that you're invested um, and I sometimes just frankly need the reminder. So um, yeah, super exciting opportunities at Ski um, and looking, I'm looking actively for, for new voices, new perspectives, um, and, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and the chance for me to connect you with a lot of other publications as well, because we're, you know, mm. we're trading, um, trading writers and sometimes some, you know, there's a new, mountain bike magazine. And I'm like, Hey, I know this guy in Connecticut, you need to work with him. Or I know this woman in Montana, that's who you should work with. So, um, as we all know, it's a small bubble and, um, you know, your reputation precedes you good or bad. So happy to refer, um, people that are easy and lovely to work with. So thanks Thank so much for your, having me. Yes. And you work for a publication that's how old now? Uh, mid seventies. So nice and young. I, th I think, yeah, it's Seth, what? No, I think it's uh, much older, right, Seth? It was, I guess, yeah, you're right. I I always, for some reason, think we're in the 2000s. Our so. historian here. 1936. <laughs> I always 19... think the 90s were 10 years ago, and that is no longer true. It hasn't been for a while. Okay. So Let's expand um, our historical horizon. Ski Magazine was founded in 1936, <laughs> the same year as the first <laughs> Alpine Olympics. Seth is a president of the International Skiing History Association, and he practically jumped through the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Our last, at last, speaker uh, is Pat Wells. And now I took French in sixth grade, so uh, Via Montagna is that is that close, Pat? No, that's well said. It's Via Montagna. What? That was close. Uh, it's uh, Pat is better known as Coach Pat. He's developed a vast experience in the publishing industry across Quebec as a sales manager, publisher, and general manager, formerly a ski, cycling, and golf coach. He's traveled the world on two wheels or a pair of skis for several decades. He lives with his partner, Mary, Mary Jo, and Vanille, their golden retriever, in the Mont Chamblant area, where he enjoys alpine touring road biking, cyclocross, and gravel biking, which is actually taking off here in Colorado. The more people uh, get injured by cars, gravel biking is mm. looking <laughs> a, lot, a lot better. Pat. Yes, well, thank you, first of all. Um, to make it different, um, I will do this in French. No. What? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tra I'll translate in the corner. I took it in school. 
<laughs> but you know, it, it, I've been listening to all of you, and it's been very inspiring. And um, first of all, um, <laughs> Via Montagne, uh, I've been working in the publishing industry. Um, I used to be the publisher of Ski Press, and I founded Tycho Press Magazine, which you know, when we say we don't believe in print anymore. I launched a magazine in Quebec for cycling. And that was the first one that came out in 31 years. And that was a very successful magazine for many years. Mm -hmm. And it still uh, lives. And <coughs> I moved on and I met um, the guys from Mountain Life because somehow their, um, their magazine really um, attracts me. and. Um, we had a good discussion and I said, there's no such thing as mountain life in Quebec. So we have to do it. And that's where Jeff, we called it V en Montagne. So it's basically um, a magazine that uh, I call it a, bi it's a bilingual magazine, which is quite different and give it a quite of a different challenge because we do have writers in French and some in English, and we have to juggle, and it becomes a very uh, puzzle for uh, the graphist Amelie to put that together because there has to be a balance. And as you know, translation doesn't go like 500 words English means 500 words in French. So the the idea behind it was to um, to do a copycat. Uh, use a skeleton of the Mountain Life magazine, which is a coffee table book that has different department that um, address different readers. And er, what we like about uh, Mountain Life via, via Montagne, it's, it's we twice a year we publish and we like to think of us as a coffee table book and that's gonna live there for the season. And one of the reasons too that, that maybe we didn't talk about much is distribution. Um, I make it a purpose to make the magazine difficult to find. And I wanna make sure that the magazine gets in the end of a reader that's gonna read it. You know, So I'm not gonna put the magazine into a grocery store with all the other publication of uh, real estate. And then it's gonna get picked up by someone and it's gonna get ditched the next week. That's not what we, we want uh, readers to pick up the magazine and look for it. And we're going into the direction of getting subscriber. Uh, but basically uh, we're not reinventing the wheels. And as far as pitching, uh, it's outdoor, it's nature, uh, mountain lifer. We're looking for great visual. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is before you start pitching your story, does it have something to back it up? Because it doesn't matter how interesting, we're not, we're not the New Yorker, you know, uh, even though I subscribe to it, but it's, it's not that we're there to make a wow factor. So the picture and the image is so important when you tell us a story because it can be the greatest story in the world, but it can look very boring on paper. So that comes to us, no, uh, no image, no photo, there's no article and what we, what I did, and uh, well, at Via Montagne is, is basically is surrounded myself with people that are better than me. Um, this is one of the tools I've been using, you know, for all my publication and uh, and working with the guy uh, at Mountain Life has been great. Uh, I think we have a, a a good product across Canada now which is, we're just uh, the little brother, the French little brother of mountain life. Um, when we have some of the uh, stories that best re uh, resonate with your readers, well, it's always when it comes to uh, a story that 
people will recognize themselves in it and something, a personage. And we try to keep, keep it in Quebec. And there's, there's, there's a difficult thing with the magazine Via Montagne is we are a large province. And if I compare that to uh, Mountain Life Blue magazine, it's more in the Collingwood area and um, some of them in Metropolitan. But we do have to address the whole Quebec. So we have to think about story that's uh, gonna come out from somewhere else from Tremblant. You know, if I only put story from my, from my knowing and from what I know, then people are gonna get fed up with it. So we have to pick and find little story that's gonna be wow factor and amaze people. And, and this is one of the big challenge that we have. So we welcome um, pitches from people. And, uh, you know, like I said before, uh, for us, it's, it's gonna be our fourth issue. Uh, we've done three so far and we have a core of writers, but each time that we do an, an, uh, an issue, we receive like 20 emails from writers that say, hey, I saw your magazine, I'd like to write for you. So that's great. Then I put them in contact with um, Frédéric, which is my new editor. And then we build from there. Um, one of the things too that's really uh, captivating is, is when you're able to do a story, you know, uh, I know there was mention about long story and, and for us, it's a very big challenge because we're bilingual. So every article gets multiplied by two. And there's so many pages that we can print without <laughs> losing money. Um, so we have to be very selective with the stories and the features. They're not gonna be longer than a thousand word in French. Mm -hmm. So that's a maximum. But then we try to um, adapt to different type of readers because we are uh, via Montagne, Mountain Life. But we, you know, you mentioned Jeff uh, Gravel. Like we're for this summer, we're pitching a story on a daughter and a father who did the 500K on a gravel bike. But the, the, the father had to follow with an electric bike. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, quite funny. And so we believe itself, it's going to be a lot more interesting uh, than presenting the event uh, that has been quite the event of the year, because we're not there to promote the event. We're not there to promote product. We're there to address the outdoor people, to touch them somehow, to to, uh, for me, uh, one of my favorite article uh, that was pitched was uh, through a photographer of mine, a friend of mine, who was in Nunavut. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was a back and forth because we were dealing with a community and we had to respect the community. And it's probably the first time, well, it is the first time in my uh, publisher life and editor life that we had to share and go back and forth with the content because it, there's such an, a fragile bubble that we had to make sure that what we print would not be offending or bringing up bad words or anything like that. So that was an interesting story and it's her, in their last winter issue. And to, to top it off, you Thank know, you. Uh, yes. because it's been a lot said about everything um, like, for example, we're working on the summer issue that's going to come in in June. So the lineup is pretty much done. Uh, it takes time to translate and stuff like that. Um, but the one thing that I'm committed to and the team is committed to is to create a community. And Mike, uh, you know, I really like what you do. And I commend you for that, you know, because magazines uh, and I'm like you I believe in it it's it's 
it's it's something that you can feel and you can smell and you can sit down with a coffee and you can read an article and you're going to be grateful after it thank but, you Pat. thank you for your yes, for your insight so um, that's what i believe in print uh, it's going to be there for a while thanks thank so you. much we have about 10 minutes for questions and uh the best way to do that is just uh, raise your hand i have a question yeah do you hear me? can you hear me yeah we can yeah. hear you so address to the group or an individual and let's no, get i have actually short. a couple i actually have a comment first um one is to um greg um did you know that jeff has a vested interest in a boda con company and that's how i got that story in <laughs> that was a joke okay. <laughs> my my second question is uh, for heather um, have you ever considered, um, uh, I, maybe you do, uh, distributing the NSAA journal to all members of NASJA as a benefit of NASJA um, membership? Um, and my third question is, oh, well, my third question is uh, to Sierra, regarding Sierra, um, the ramifications of the outside uh, magazine situation and how that's going to Im impact the media, which just basically broke today. And then my final comment is to Mike about, I think you're doing a wonderful thing with your, uh, with the, the Gazette. So kudos to you. So, so Jeff, you know, well, you know, we, we all want to know what you're doing. Um, Heather, um, NASJA uh, may be uh, providing uh, the NSA journal to all members of NASJA as a benefit. And if, if you're not already doing that um, outside, this is an open question to anybody about the new developments today. And um, that's pretty much it. Comments? Yeah, I can address the question for the journal. Um, we keep our, our distribution pretty tight to ski areas and, and members of NSAA, just because there is some occasionally some sensitive or some proprietary information in there. <clears throat> and so, excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we, we really uh, try to keep that, that distribution very um, specific to our membership. Thank you. And Sierra, yeah, sure as far I'm... as, um, and hopefully I'm understanding your question right, but as far as the implications of this merger, you know, in the past two years, I've been through too many to name mergers, buyouts, sales, name changes, like furloughs, new hires. I mean, it's just any way you can look at it. I've gone through it and, you know, that's not unique to me. That's happened to so many, um, probably a lot of you as well. Um, no company is perfect um, and there are challenges ahead for all of us in this group, but I can say um, in the two months I've spent there, seeing a CEO and, and a you know, governing board that um, actually skis, actually bikes, actually climbs, actually goes outside um, and has a real business model and a real plan and something new to try with this membership model and is willing to invest you know, in talent. They went and hired every single person that got laid off from the bike magazine title and started a brand new magazine and a whole new brand. So they understand um, the relationships that are already established. They understand um, the sports that we do and why we do them. Um, and so while yes, it's a, it's a massive conglomeration, from my perspective to see anyone investing in, in media, investing in storytelling, whether that's on a corporate level or you know, on a small local newspaper level, that's a plus, that's a win. Um, that's opportunities for all of us and it's, and it's stories that we're being able to tell to our readers who want this. And frankly, right now, I think we all need it, you know? Um, so I think change is scary. Um, you know, big business can be scary, but this is someone who I, from my experience, sees the value um, and understands that doing good work costs money and is willing to put some of that funds into it so that we can put it into you guys. 
Can I can I ask a follow up question, Jeff? Yeah. Um, yeah. So so in terms of uh, other the broader media, do you see this um, Sierra as a trend going forward for not just the the type of topics you you deal with, but do you see this as a trend overall? And that would impact you know how people cover different aspects, whether it's snow sports or outdoor or whatever it is. It, it, do you see that as a trend? Um, you know, I think it's been the case for some time that, you know, a, that media companies exist and have whole portfolios, right? So that's not a totally new um, business model. And I think that will continue because, um, you know, it's expensive to, to create good art and good work and um, people can find ways to do it independently. Like, um, like Mike has, that's incredible and that's awesome. Um, but the reality is it, it costs money and by being part of our portfolio, you have access to um, shared resources and things like that. So I think that that will continue. Um, I think regardless of you know, who owns these titles across the board, like ski is still ski you know, and climbing is climbing. And, and in many ways we still operate within kind of our own you know, ecosystem that I think is supported by and benefits from being part of, you know, the larger portfolio. Um, but I see it's just, it's one way. And I think for us, it's working. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Yes, Jeff. Um, so first of all, I wanna thank all the editors tonight. It's already uh, 8.13 for saying yes. And we have a nice balance of men and women as well. So I wanna know, let's talk a, like a few, seconds about diversity. I know I've pitched a lot of stories on diversity and they've been published and it's been a hot topic this year. Uh, are you also balancing for next year who your writers are, are, are or, you know, like, like the stories we can, uh, we, you know, because in the past it's, it's been a lot of like, like we say the white men ski magazine and I've been reading since I was uh, five years old. So can any of you weigh on, on how that the story is evolving? You know, like it's fun for me to interview these cool stories that are not being seen in the mainstream media and all of you I admire, so take it away. I'll jump in quickly. So um, I, grew up, I grew up in New York. I grew up with a, a relatively diverse community. Um, I, I changed our editorial direction. Um, by saying stories that happen anytime you walk outside. So sure, we had Dorworth, old white dude writing about Spider Savage, old white dude story that's been told a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, new perspective. Uh, at the same time, we had um, Sadie Stein, who is one of the editors of the Paris Review, write a story about the New York City Bird Watching Club that was at the center of the Central Park Karen debate oh. last year, if you guys remember that. We, we didn't. We didn't write about that shit. We didn't write about Central Park Karen, like that, too much ink was spilled about that. We were actually more curious about what's up with this bird watching club in New York City. You know, <laughs> we thought that'd be really interesting. And that is an outdoor story. And I'll tell you that um, those folks are just as nerdy as the people here. Like, you know, focusing on like gear and apps and good protocols and bad protocols. And Christian Cooper, who was at the center of that Central Park Karen thing, great dude, he helped, um, revitalize New York City's uh, planning department. So new buildings in New York City have to account for uh, migratory patterns of birds. Um, he, you know, so I, I think like it's just, it, it is on the editors. Um, what I worry about is the pandering stories that come because I think they're cheap. Um, it's like I, being from the East Coast, going to powder, like when I first got there, it was like, let's write an East Coast ski story. Cool. It was like J Peak. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we all know there's way more out there than just that. So I just think it takes more work. Um, I've been just trying to seek out good work from folks and then letting them kind of direct where the magazine goes from there. I think um, one of our photographers, Gina Danza, just said like two months ago, she's the first, uh, we elevated her to senior photographer. She helped us put out the first issue. Um, we named her a senior photographer. Why? Because we're only seven months old and she helped us the most. So why wouldn't we name <laughs> a photographer? She announced that she's the uh, first black woman to ever be named a senior photographer in an outdoor title. That was not my intention, 
we just gave her a platform and let her do her work. She went to some other outdoor titles and they wanted, they're like, oh, you know, your landscape photos don't look like what we normally run or whatever. I think what we have to recognize is that if we want different perspectives, we're going to have different editorial and that means our magazines are going to change. And that's, uh, that's how we're approaching it. And, and I'm, I'm happy. I'm pleased with the work I'm getting because it's not the, the same stuff over and over again. But I, I just think like we're a home for high quality work, um, regardless of where you grew up or recreating and where you recreate now. So that's what we're trying to do. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, to piggyback on what Mike said, a lot of that challenge for editors is we all want diversity, both with a capital D and a small case D in content. Some of the challenges finding diverse voices to express the diversity of opinion. And we don't want the same writers talking about diversity because at times, as Mike said, that falls into cliche. And we're very, very sensitive, and at times perhaps hypersensitive, on having the same voices address this diversity issue. So I love when I can find a diverse voice, and it doesn't have to be with a capital D, but a diverse voice that brings a new perspective. So a lot of it is us catching up with the environment of writers and photographers and having various brands in the industry help develop the youth so we get different voices. So part of the challenge is finding the appropriate people without falling <laughs> into the cliche trap. And right. it's hard, you know, and, and, and we make hard decisions. I had to turn down a story the other day uh, that didn't fit the person who was writing about it. It was a great topic, but the person who was writing about it was going to fall into that cliche trap, even though he's a good writer. It was the wrong person to address yeah. this topic. So that's a challenge. Can, can I jump in here, Thank you. Jeff? I, I want to give Jeff some kudos here, Greg, because he has definitely reached out to the National Brotherhood of Skiers, you know, to try to get them mm. more involved with NASJA. And, you know, kudos to Jeff, because, uh, you know, I mean, that's there's got to be a little bit more communication between the different organizations within the ski industry. And it, sure. it's not just the National Brotherhood of Skiers. There's a lot no. of diverse groups out there that have not been recognized. And I think, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, Jeff, you, you owe me one here, so. Well, we also, uh, <laughs> changed, we changed our description of the organization to make it more inclusive. Exactly. And these are just small baby steps. Totally. Certainly we have so much more work to do in that regard. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I had, oh, oh, sorry. I, did, no, I, I did, just, no, I just posted a, um, a story about a group of black women, business women that I had never heard of um, on my website. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, um, we're getting heard little by little. I'm, I'm Mary McCann, I published the Snow Industry Letter. And um, um, so I do a lot of searching Thanks, around. Yeah. You do a great <laughs> job. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Any other questions? I do, because we were talking about comedy and keeping it light because we are writing about snow sports. So a uh, question to uh, my friend Ian. I think over the years you were saying uh, writers were not pestering editors, but you said you might have a, a few good stories of uh, stalkers, like people oh. who, who insist on getting printed. Do you feel like sharing it with us? <laughs> so, uh, no, not really. Yeah. <laughs> Just the, um, that was in the We're days, not pres you know, in the days when uh, we had uh, a landline and a uh, <laughs> home line, and I mistakenly gave my, my home line out to um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, very aggressive um, uh, contributors. <laughs> and uh, it didn't matter if it was Saturday night at midnight, I'd be getting phone calls, and um, uh, it was uh, showing up at the door. And uh, yeah, it was oh my God. crazy stuff. But that's the thing when you get along so well with your contributors, uh, then we're all friends too. And if even if I wasn't uh, assigning stories and photographs, you'd still be friends with and scheme with each other. So there's that, that weird <laughs> you're like line. A, you're like a Thank rock you. star. That's where you take that ice axe off the wall. <laughs> okay, can I? Oh. Have <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. We have time for one more question. I think we might be done. Okay. One more question. Yo, Martin yes. Griff, what do you do with the line of people around your house waiting to meet you? 
<laughs> Good one. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. I think, you know, we learned a lot and I hope many of you will, will be able to uh, monetize these uh, pitch suggestions as you move forward in your writing. Um, so stay safe and we'll see you all March 23rd for our annual meeting. Same bat channel, same place, same time. Thank <laughs> you, guys. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for that ice axe. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> thank you. If anyone wants to stay on, I'm happy to keep chatting. I like told my wife I'd be home at six. So I've got yeah, to there's an app race key, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you Just grab, tell us grab about your that. drink. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks so much. And Mike, I'm going to send you a note about exploration that kind of can uh, maybe jog your you guys the opera. theme about yeah. it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'd love to. I'd love to chat with that group. Um, mm. We're uh, so uh, our editor at large came from Vice Magazine. Shout out to Montreal originally. Everyone knows that's where it started. But um, nice. we've been lucky partnering with um, with him. He just he knows um, a large group of writers who were writing for Vice forever. They all they all have their outdoor hero, and um, I just think like the diversity thing is not difficult for for me only because I'm I'm relaunching something I there is a precedent of excellent writing and if that's my precedent then there's plenty of excellent writers from diverse backgrounds and so really for me it's just like I've been seeking out as many writer associations journalist associations just to be like and not and not cherry picking if you know what I mean by that not like oh I'll grab mm -hmm. whatever anyone everyone um, I'm so excited I wish I had it in here it's in my car one of the things we did um, and I'd love to have some of your members mentor next fall is um, a local Truckee high school partnered with a high school in Mammoth and over zoom they published an insert from the local paper I don't know if you can see that oh it's so bad yeah, yeah. yeah. either way they published um, a student newspaper in the local newspaper, it's 20,000 circ, uh, called the High Alpine Press. And they wrote about skiing, snowboarding, climbing, the pressures of like Zoom high school, video games not being attractive anymore because you've just played them too damn much. And like, I'm trying to cultivate these kids because as everyone, you know, the teacher advisor was like, oh, you're just trying to create your farm system for you. I was like, no. I want one of these kids to go be the editor of Outside Magazine. I want one of these kids to join NASJ, like that's like 16 and can crush it. So that's. Uh, we have a, a, a student rate. Mm -hmm. If you're cool. a student journalist, um, I think it's around $24. You can join NASJ. That um, came up because I wrote, um, I wrote, I was a ski journalist at Syracuse University and tried to join NASJ. Wow. At the time it was called the Eastern Ski Writers. <laughs> and, and they said, no, no, you got to be a professional. And I was crushed. I was totally crushed. <laughs>